Uh, so Eisen is a political scientist and human rights activist whose work focuses on democratic theory, human rights, and constitutional law. In recent years, she's been conducting research on the transition from democracy to authoritarian rule in Turkey, looking in particular at the impact new laws and policies have had on the basic rights and liberties of women, ethnic, religious, and sexual minorities. Born and raised in Turkey, Professor Kandas did her doctoral studies at Columbia University, uh, studying with Ira Katz Nelson, I believe. And um, after receiving her PhD, she returned to teach political science and international relations at Bo Bogazici University, where as a tenured member of the faculty, she helped establish the European School of Politics. In 2016, she went into exile uh, along with hundreds of other Turkish academics who were being persecuted for having signed a petition that called on the government to stop committing acts of violence in Kurdish villages. Between 2017 and 2020, Professor Kandas taught at Yale University where she served as the Henry Hart Rice Fellow at the Macmillan Center and as visiting professor in the Department of Political Science. She's spending this semester as a visiting professor at Hunter College, uh, giving uh, courses on totalitarian and totalitarianism and authoritarianism in the Department of Science and the Human Rights Program, and an introductory course in, in the Human Rights Program at Roosevelt House at Hunter College. I'm absolutely delighted to be able to uh, host um, Eisen here, and her topic today is Misconceptions About Right-Leaning Populism. Following her presentation, we'll have an opportunity for uh, questions and answers and some um, informal discussion as well. So thank you, Eisen, for joining us. You're on. Thank you for inviting me. Thank you for this really kind and generous, too generous introduction. It's wonderful to be addressing this audience. Uh, at this time uh, about uh, this subject and uh, right-leaning populism. And uh, I'm, I'm really happy you're giving me this opportunity uh, to uh, share part of my research on right-leaning populism. I think I'm going to be taking about 40 minutes of your time. I'm not going to be talking about Turkey or these other countries, but I'm going to be looking at more theoretically uh, at what level uh, should we understand right-leaning populism? Where does it come from? What is, a symptom, what is it a symptom of? I'm going to look at that from a more uh, theoretical perspective. So um, it seems to me, um, and I'm going to share my uh, screen. I have a, a PowerPoint presentation because there are lots of readings, parts of readings that I would like to share. All right. So there are two dominant methods of analysis or um, in our public discourse on populism, we keep talking about right-leaning populism in two uh, ways. The first is very much methodologically individualist, leader-based. It looks at the character defects, speeches, gestures of this person. And uh, the, because the problem is so much the character of the leader, the remedy is typically removing this leader from the office. <laughs> Although this remedy is necessary, it's probably insufficient if uh, right-leaning populism has something beyond it uh, that causes it. Um, and uh, so this methodologically individualist approach as a result puts too much emphasis, I'm going to argue, on the agency of the leader and essentially ignores more structural, historical and political terrain on which right-leaning populism gains ascendancy. And there's a polar opposite, methodologically speaking, approach, which we again encounter in public discourse when we talk about populism, right-leaning populism. And that approach is on the contrary, structuralist, deep structuralist, talks about the infrastructure and the mode of production. And um, 
perhaps following Ralph Miliband's approach from the 1970s, it seems to argue that the state is the servant of the bourgeoisie and right-leaning populism is probably the servant of the monopoly capitalist. Now, uh, the problem here is capitalism and the crisis of capitalism, which is perennial. The remedy is dismantling the capitalist state and anti-capitalism and revolution. And in this approach, as opposed to the first one, we have too much emphasis on infrastructure and deep structure at the expense of political agency and political responsibility. Um, I think what is common to both in, those, in both these approaches is the fact that they are both apolitical. What do I mean by politics? Um, I'm using politics in two senses uh, in the next uh, half an hour. First is the art of negotiation, compromise and reconciliation among divergent interests. And second, in a more Aristotelian sense, is purposive action. Uh, determining an end result that we would like to attain and finding the most appropriate means of attaining it. Uh, so, uh, going back to our approaches here, uh, they are apolitical from, from these perspectives because uh, the first one obviously only focuses on the leader figure and his character flows. And uh, whereas if there is a malady there, probably that's merely the symptom of it. And uh, the deep structural analysis uh, is apolitical because, you know, it, it, it has to wait for the revolution to occur or it has to wait for uh, a progressive kind of anti-capitalism to occur. It doesn't really go into the depth of having to tackle the political terrain in which um, right-leaning populism emerges. So both of these approaches obviously have a grain of truth in them. Both are, you know, uh, right in saying that leadership analysis, leader-based analysis, when it talks about the character flaws, the messiah complex, irrationality, you know, the um, missionary zeal of these populist figures, uh, it's it's correct in underlining the significance of those. But to the extent that it keeps us away uh, from looking at this as a, as a system, as a, as, a, as, a, as a new kind of promise, as a new kind of politics, uh, we wouldn't be able to get at the problem uh, by merely focusing on the leadership's uh, flows. And more or less, because this analysis stays on the descriptive, purely descriptive level, uh, we sometimes uh, have this self-satisfaction by having discovered some witty quip about the character flows, then we feel satisfied that we have uh, done our duty. Uh, in, uh, you know, that it's a political act just by defining what the populist leader looks like or acts like. And the, in the deep structural analysis, again, because it, it looks at the macro level, very macro, macro level, as opposed to the micro uh, in, the, in the first, um, it, it doesn't really engage itself it finds it beneath itself to look at the particular circumstances in which a movement such as the right-leaning populism uh, emerges and gains ascendancy. And that's a problem. So the third approach I'm going to propose, uh, and it's not my approach, it's an approach uh, as I'm going to show you that was embraced by some very nuanced analysis from uh, the study of fascism of 1930s. This third approach, uh, the one I, I think we should really uh, pay more attention to is the one that's at the meso level. It's not at the micro, it's not at the macro, but the middle level, historical institutionalist analysis. And um, it looks at, in particular, the crisis of the state understood as a crisis of representation and a crisis of legitimacy, a dual crisis, and state's inability as a result of those, of conducting uh, its duty, of conducting what it was supposed to be doing. What is the state supposed to be doing? Uh, this uh, Miliband uh, 
Fulansa's debate. Some of you, mo most of you will remember that debate. What is the role, uh, what is the state under, what is the capitalist state under the conditions of capitalism? There was that debate in uh, New, New Left Review uh, from 60, 1969 till the end of 70s really. And there was a back and forth between Ralph Miliband, today's David Miliband's father, I believe, and uh, Nikos Plansas, and they are debating this question. Um, Miliband's proposal is, you know, he explained as to why uh, a capital, capitalist state, qua capitalist state, has to be the servant uh, of, the, of the bourgeoisie if it's going to be a real uh, capitalist state. Uh, Plansas gives him a very nuanced res response, and since then we call that the relative autonomy argument. He says, in order to fulfill its functions as a capitalist state, on the contrary, the state has to take a distance and make itself relatively autonomous from the bourgeoisie. Because the bourgeoisie and portions of it typically have internally divergent, diverse interests among them, narrow interests among them. And the state's role is to reconcile and unite those interests and put it in the form of a common interest for the bourgeoisie, and then reconcile these, if it's the welfare state we're talking about, of course, they are talking about the welfare state. Um, it, it has to reconcile those interests with the interests of the working classes. Now, when we speak about, in this, in this genre, when we speak about the crisis of the state, we are really talking about precisely uh, the fact that state cannot fulfill those functions. A, uniting the divergent, internally divergent, uh, divergent interests of the bourgeoisie. And secondly, that it's unable to bring those together with the interests of the working classes. Working class interests typically are uh, debated and uh, united through trade unions and uh, leftist parties, left-leaning parties. And uh, these are represented at the uh, state level. So state does not do that one, but it has to reconcile whatever is the decision of those masses. Uh, and it has to reconcile it with the, uh, that of, that of uh, bourgeoisie. Now, why is uh, Weimar experience relevant to our experience is uh, because um, I'm going to talk about two reasons uh, for this. The first one is, although I'm not going to be talking about at length about David Abraham and a very interesting essay he has written in 1977, <clears throat> I think his argument is very relevant for us. Uh, he says, it was not an inevitability on the part of um, Weimar to turn itself into a Nazi-style fascism. And uh, he looks at the, um, you know, we always talk about this, you know, uh, that they couldn't get together, communists and socialists, SPD and KPD, they couldn't get together. So we had this left fragmentation uh, story from the Weimar. So we know about this tragedy a little, a little bit, but we keep talking about the left fragmentation. Uh, what's interesting in David Abraham's article is he introduces five more coalitions that could be set up that brought those forces together, that could bring those forces together, and none of which would have resulted in fascism. Now, th this is interesting. So even, even then, uh, even under those circumstances that were particularly tough for Germany because there were multiple crises, as you know, and there was external shock of war and post-war settlement. We always talk about constantly how these circumstances could never be replicated elsewhere as there were so many overlapping crises happening at the same time. Yet uh, the, the, the thing we have to get out of this, the point uh, is, uh, it wasn't inevitable even then. There were five more coalitions that could be set up. So it's even more tragic than we thought <laughs> it was. If Abraham is right, uh, it's not merely even uh, the left fragmentation, but uh, the, the middle class disunity 
and their incapability of putting their narrow interests aside, their in inability to reconcile their interests so that they could uh, form a, um, another type of coalition that wouldn't result in, uh, in a coalition with the Nazi party. The second reason, so this lack of inevitability is important. The second one is, um, I think some of the crises that define that period that we thought could not be replicated are eerily present today uh, in our circumstances. So um, I'm going to you know, talk a little bit about that, but you can guess uh, there is the globalization, now there is a backlash against globalization. As a result of that, I don't know whether you're familiar with him, with his work, but there is there's someone, uh, a guy standing, who was an a ILO um, bureaucrat, and he's now teaching uh, in London. And he published a few books on the precaria, talking about how there is a class dissolution and social dislocation going on in the class structure of advanced capitalist societies in the course of the past 20 years or so. And he has been warning a little bit about those uh, dislocations for a while. And um, if nothing was enough, if the economic <laughs> crisis, if the political crisis uh, of, the, of the state, its inability to address those uh, political dislocations and crisis of political representation were not enough, now we have the external shock of the global pandemic. So I think uh, the situation is perhaps in some respects uh, eerily, eerily, uh, similar to what was going on then. So I'm going to go to the analysis of these two, two basic readings that we're going to look at. I'm going to be talking about Timothy Mason as well a little bit, but I'm going to be focusing on basically Carl Levenstein's uh, 1935 uh, essay, Autocracy versus Democracy, which was published in the APSR. And um, he was a constitutional lawyer and an emigre. And uh, he was observing at the beginning of 1930s, first hand experience as a constitutional lawyer, the similarities among those uh, movements that were popping all around Europe. And he's trying to understand them and he's trying to define a way out of it for the world, how not to uh, repeat that. And um, uh, the second article that we're going to be spending a little bit of time or more time is uh, Jeff Ely's 1933, uh, 1983 essay titled uh, What is Right Leaning Populism? What is Fascism? Uh, what is Fascism? Let me see. What produces Fascism? Pre industrial traditions or the crisis of a capitalist state. We're going to spend quite a bit of time uh, on this, and I'm going to share some portions of, of this uh, with you. Now, uh, I'm going to go back to reading a little bit. Um, in 1935, uh, when the fascist style totalitarianism was on the rise, a constitutional lawyer and an emigre, Carl Levinstein, called it an autocracy. Lewinstein defined autocracy as the unification of powers under, lead, under the leadership principle. Unlike dictatorships in the past, he argued that the modern dictator acts under the metaphysical impulse of a vocation, which is a strange mixture of personal ambition and superpersonal patriotism. Most significantly, Lewinstein argued, fascists saw themselves as the orders of a new economic order. Paraphrasing from Mussolini, Lewinstein stated that fascists believed the corporative form of political life must be and will be the universal form of government in the future, that Mussolini marketed it as an economic device. That economic model, it seemed to Lewinstein, was being marketed as the cure for economic depression. He says, no country, regardless of its political structure, has been able to remain outside of the economic world depression. 
world depression is a result of the war and the peace treaties, as well as of, of the technological developments of the post-war period. While the political units have unfolded the flag of economic nationalism, it is useless to expect the restoration of the economic equilibrium through the market. National economic autarky has become the catchword. Governmental interference is everywhere considered as indispensable. According to Levinstein, although it was clear that the Nazis were against representative democracy, Weimar's lenient democratic institutions allowed the Nazi party to expand its space and enter the parliament. Hitlerism was allowed to use democracy for the explicit purpose of destroying democracy, he says. The anti-parliamentarian cohorts entered the legislative bodies with the unreserved intention to rack the parliamentary machinery. According to Levinstein, the Nazi party deliberately divided in order to rule, deliberately polarized and destabilized the society in order to prepare the ground for its coup d'etat. Small fires of political unrest are kindled until the attention of the whole community is aroused, he says. The existing system of government is utterly discredited, a political, social, and economic program of astounding contradictions is proclaimed, and wild promises of every kind are lavishly given to everybody in a permanent state of disorder and disturbance created in the country. Mass meetings and public demonstrations help to ferment the agitation. The most obvious truth is distorted by oversimplification of the most obvious facts. Demagogic slogans calculated for the lowest intellectual level of the masses are propagated until the country is uh, one seething mass of conflicting desires. The whole pandemonium is accompanied by the drowning step of the marching legionnaires, he says. And again, the whole nation is divided into two camps of belligerent parties ready and prepared for rebellion and civil war. And here is what Lovenstein says about the class comp composition, about the groups that lend support to uh, Nazis. The farmers are most readily accessible to the fascist technique. They are habitually dissatisfied and suffer the most from the depression of world prices. Second come the middle classes, deprived of their savings. And thirdly, the vast army of the unemployed and the youth of all classes. In the background are always concealed some wealthy reactionaries who provide financial support. So despite the fact that then he regarded the leadership principle as a central feature of the fascist movement, Lovenstein did not think the character or the abilities of the leader mattered. I mean, uh, he spends quite a bit of time talking about the leadership principle. And then he says, as the leadership principle works automatically, automatically by its inherent spell, Without regard to the special aptitudes of the man himself, the ascendancy of the leader is easily established. And again, the astounding fact that the person of the leader is less important than the leadership principle itself. If only the mechanism of the fascist movement can be set in motion, the particular persons who operate it are irrelevant. There is no lack of ambitious men willing to rise by this irrational process to glory and power, who in the normal functioning of the slow and tedious process of political selection, never had the slightest chance to become head of a state. Levinstein continues to say the army and the civil service offer no serious resistance. There's the terrorizing influence of the first purging measures, suppression of the media, suppression of organized opposition, and the lamentable lack of resistance of democratic government to the attacks of the fascist enemy. 
And this essay, this 1935 essay, must be the first instance when uh, Karl Lewinstein uses the term a militant democracy. He turns that into a series of articles in 1937, two years later, uh, again publishes them in the a a APSR. He says, in other democracies, governments recovering from the enchantment have recognized the situation and have adopted measures to overcome the danger. Legislative measures against subversive propaganda and abuse of democratic liberties of free speech, free press and free association were enacted and the necessary steps were taken to forbid the undermining practices of the fascist propaganda, the forming of private armies, the wearing of party uniforms and badges in public and the parading, which are so essential for the initial display of fascist activities. The example of the countries mentioned, he says, proves that democracy becoming militant can be saved. Lewinstein noted the similarities between fascist movements in various European countries, and he was adamant in underlining that in its early stages, fascism marketed itself as the, uh, to the world as a cure for the economic crisis, as an economic model. He believed democracies needed to turn militant and they should recognize what he calls an uh, almost scientific and repeated pattern of conquest uh, by, the, by the fascists. In spite of slight national differences, he says, the similarities of the fascist movements in the various democratic countries are so striking as to be token common causations of origin and growth. Now, precisely this urge uh, to find fascism's common causations of origin and growth occupied the, mi the minds of a few generations of scholars in the course of the next few decades in the post-war period. By the end of the 1970s, the striking similarities between the fascist movements of various European countries during the 1920s and 30s, the similarities that were documented by Lewinstein have long been forgotten. The horrors of fascism were now, that uh, is now 70s, 80s, were now getting studied as if these were singular and two particular events whose emergence can only be attributed to Italy's and Germany's quote unquote exceptionalism, namely their lateness in unification and industrialization. It is in that context that the eminent historian Jeff Ely presented his review of the literature on fascism in 1983 with an article titled What Produces Fascism, Pre-Industrial Traditions or the Christ of a Capitalist State. Here in this article, the problem Ely tackles is the overlapping consensus among the scholars regarding the causes of fascism. According to the literature that Ely reviews, that cause was the resiliency of pre-industrial tradition, a backwardness, backwardness syndrome, which was deemed to be acute in the cases of Italy and Germany during the 1920s and 30s. In his response, Ely refutes this thesis by making several factual and theoretical points. According to him, what determined the fascist affiliations of certain strata, such as those of the white color workers, had little to do with their being essentially conservative, but a lot to do with the left-leaning parties not having bothered to recruit them while the fascists put considerable effort to, to doing just that. What Ely finds most troubling uh, here uh, is that, um, uh, they were instead of a backwardness. What we ex what we see in the uh, uh, Germany and Italy cases, uh, as uh, Ily demonstrates, uh, is a, is an uneven development. On the one hand, they were experiencing accelerated capitalist transformation, uh, through which entire regions were being visibly converted from predominantly rural into predominantly urban industrial environments. But in both cases, again, uh, in both Italy and Germany, the process was extremely uneven with equally large regions trapped 
into social and economic backwardness. It was the coexistence of those modes of produ production rather than uh, feudalism as such, uh, as a mode of production and its resilience and its traditional uh, relationships. And according to him, because of this uneven development, uh, there were some complex political effects. And uh, these in turn led to a new kind of nationalism. This radical nationalism was a new phenomena. It was not simply the revival of old nationalism. It was born out of the dissolution of the old establishment, old classes, old ruling bloc, and very uneven development. And here is how Ely talks about it. He says, during the 1890s in both Germany and Italy, the existing and existing political bloc of industrial, agrarian, and military bureaucratic interests entered a protracted period of instability, an incipient dissolution from which it never really recovered. With such widespread political uncertainty, large numbers of the educated citizenry experienced a radical skepticism about the appropriateness of the existing political forms, which were largely liberal and parliamentary. Such people took recourse to a new kind of radical nationalism, which stressed the primacy of national allegiances and priorities under circumstances of unprecedented popular mobilization, this lack of confidence in the unifying imagination of the liberal and conservative political establishment acquired an extra political edge. He characterizes this dissenting radical national politics as a new kind of right-wing populism in 1983. This new right kind of populism, according to Ely, was as much a backlash against the left, which was getting stronger, as it was a political response of the middle classes to the failure of particularly the liberal and center-right parties as these failed to unify their interests. This was a confidence and legitimacy crisis and a crisis of political representation and turned itself into a massive mass mobilization under the politically skillful leadership of the Nazis. And here we encounter, in a way, 1980s version of the anti-establishment uh, protest in radical right-wing populism. However, the establishment that they turned against was not simply one that was all powerful and intact, but on the contrary, the protest was born out of the fact that the establishment has dissolved. They were, in fact, protesting a failing state, a failed bloc, a ruling bloc, and failing liberal and conservative middle class parties. Uh, the most important evidence I think Illy provides uh, in this article to refute the deterministic pre industrial tradition argument and to emphasize the significance of the dynamic political field concerns the eclectic coalitions that the Nazis managed to forge. Ely says, despite the overrepresentation of the petite bourgeoisie, fascist parties were always more eclectic in their social recruitment than much of the literature leads us to suppose. Peasants, peasants again, like Lovenstein, Peasants proved especially important in turning fascism into a mass party. On the other hand, it's also clear that many fascist parties acquired significant working class support. And again, he asserts, there is a tendency in the literature to play down the importance of this working class support in the interests of the petit bourgeois thesis. It seems clear that the Nazis failed to breathe these historic strongholds of the labor movement and had to be content with those categories of workers the left had failed or neglected to organize. Yet, he says, this was surely significant enough Though not a sufficient basis for contesting the left's core support, it deprived the left of a much needed larger constituency. Ely argues the left also needed to craft a similarly eclectic broad coalition, but it could not do that. <laughs> 
he says, it became imperative for the left to break out of the class political ghetto by building broader political alliances and by appealing not only to workers, but to white color employees, small owners, pensioners, professional people, students, and so on. Most of all, it was imperative to conceive of other than class collectivities, rallying the people as consumers, as women, as taxpayers, as citizens, even as Germans, not as some opportunist and eclectic pluralism of discrete campaigns, but as the coherent basis for the broadest possible democratic unity. Yet it was in this democratic project that the politics of the left proved lamentably deficient. It was less the left's inability to carry the working class itself than its abdication according to Ely, from this wider popular democratic mobilization that proved most fatal to the Republic's survival. Arguably, it was precisely here that fascism showed its superiority. He continues later. Um, in the end, uh, is it here? No. Um, where am I? Yeah, uh, in the end, he says, the most striking thing about the Nazi party uh, is, is, was not its disproportionate dependence on a particular social group, such as the petite bourgeoisie, but its ability to broaden its social base in several dif different directions. The promiscuous adaptability of Nazi propaganda has often been noted, and it was certainly adapted, tapping manifold popular resent resentments, promising all and nothing in the same breath. Though both cynical and opportunist, Nazi eclecticism was also a major constructive achievement. It not only subsumed the organizational fragmentation of the right, it also united a broadly based coalition of the subordinate classes centered on the peasantry and petite bourgeoisie, but stretching deep into the wage earning population. And based on these observations, then Ely redefines fascism. Uh, at the very end of his essay, he says, fascism may be best understood as primarily a counter-revolutionary ideological project constituting a new kind of popular coalition. As such, it provided motivation for radicalized political actors who were embittered by national humiliation and enraged by the advance of the left. So this is a dynamic political field. Um, to bring Levinstein's and Ely's uh, arguments together, we can perhaps say the following. The right-leaning populism uh, if, you know, I'm assuming they are the same thing as, um, you know, my research, the more I research that period and, uh, and Turkey and Poland and Hungary, uh, the more I realize, um, you know, there are very striking similarities. So uh, I think we can adopt uh, Ely's definition of right-leaning uh, populism to say it's a proto-fascist counter-revolutionary movement. It is the mass mobilizational initial phase of fascism. It's a transitory movement because it's a mass mobilizational snapshot after they consolidate power. Of course, they are going to get rid of the masses. It skillfully constructs, constructs an eclectic cross-class, cross-identity coalition. It's an autarkic political response to the economic crisis as well as to the crisis of the state. Its success lies in its political skill, organizational flexibility, in its ability to forge, dissolve, and remake broad-based coalitions that unify the bourgeoisie with the masses. It divides the middle classes and the working classes within themselves. It unites divergent, even antagonistic forces on the basis of their common hatreds, common enemies, common anxieties, hatred of the left and hatred of inclusionary constitutional state. And it discards its coalition partners one by one when they no longer serve its purposes. 
Timothy Mason cogently shows in another article that I, I'm not talking about here, but I, I'm going to say this, how the Nazis, uh, you know, uh, had come to power on the shoulders of heavy industry and export-oriented industry, peasants and urban working class support. But by 1936, they became not relatively, but completely autonomous from the industrial interests. Mason calls fascist style anti-capitalism at that moment, primacy of politics that the Nazis put into operation once they fully consolidated power. Mason shows that unlike what infrastructural determinism would want us to believe, by 1936 onwards, the regime was simply anti-capitalist, yet fully Nazi-style fascist. So here are some conclusions from these readings. Um, Right-leaning populism is the first mass mobilizational, mobilizational phase of fascism. It should be opposed at the level where it arises and where it proves to be the most successful, and that's the meso level, um, the political level. And it's most successful in forging eclectic coalitions, recruiting from all classes, recruiting from all identities, including the working classes, till it strikes a model of cross-class and cross-class identity compromise among divergent interests. So it takes over the function of the failed state when it does that, when it manages to uh, fulfill the function of uniting those diverging, divergent interests. It offers an economic planning model, a form of the interventionist state, thus it's not a neoliberal or non-interventionist. It's an interventionist state model, it's an autarky. Um, it offers a fascist political remedy to a failing state, a state in crisis. It offers a solidarity model that promises a new form of redistribution, not in the sense of an inclusivist democratic welfare state, but in the sense of one that promises to take from the enemies through civil and conventional war and through terror to redistribute the pillage to the quote-unquote genuine nation. We should never forget that the Nazi state nationalized the property of its Jewish citizens, wage wars of plunder, and as Franz Neumann showed very clearly, it was also a full employment state with perks and social benefits for its Aryan, quote unquote, working population. To conclude, we are not simply facing an economic crisis and the very infant phase of a, a digital revolution and a global pandemic. We are also dealing with the crisis of the state, its crisis of legitimacy and its crisis of political representation. The proto-fascist movement is but the first political response to these multiple crises and the first candidate that aims to take over the role of the state Right-leaning populism markets itself not as a political regime change, but as a new form of exclusionary solidarity and a new form of redistribution, a new model of running the economy. This constitutes its mass appeal. Its mass appeal is not merely racism, but the anticipation that had, unleashing a systemic racism would lead to a new redistribution from the regime's enemies to the genuine nation. The populist leader promises to be the new state, poses itself as the new and singular arbiter of divergent interests and the uniter of the nation. Leadership's function is not merely superficial uh, and it's not uh, purely at the uh, deep uh, structural level. Uh, and it's not merely ideological. The leadership principle is the new, efficient, quickly acting interventionist state and a patronage-based economic model. It is the political success of populism to market this model to very diverse groups and, and masses. This is what brings it to power, particularly when there's no rival democratic offer from other sections of society.
fascists, when they fully consolidate power, no longer unite or represent the interests of the groups that brought them to power. They become completely autonomous, even from the monopoly capitalists. In Neumann's words, Neumann's words, by the end of the 1930s, at the start of uh, you know, um, 1940s, he says this, the Nazi state was no longer a state. To face the formidable enemy, we will have to remember that the capitalist state has to perform this dual function. It has to unite the internally diverse interests of the bourgeoisie and reconcile these with the interests of the mass working classes. Of course, this was, as I said before, at the very beginning, Plancis's response to Miliband in the 1970s. But the state's inability to strike an inclusionary compromise, it's failing to fulfill that function, is the most pivotal crisis in locating the critical loophole where radical populism enters the democratic stage only to dismantle it. And lastly, while I do think we face an eerily sim similar conundrum, I'm afraid in some ways we're normatively and politically even less prepared to face it today than the relevant populations were during the 1930s. For one, our increasingly normalized relativism inhibits many of us to see universality of oppression and the universality of human dignity and human rights. This moral relativism and double standard about human rights that go hand in hand with the resurgence of nationalism and religious nationalisms substantially limited the ability of law, history, and political science disciplines to study political regime transformations comparatively. To the dismay of the eminent political scientist Giovanni Sartori, by 1990s, we immediately got rid of totalitarianism as a polar type as, and as a pure type from the political regime classifications. As a result, in the post-Cold War period, we are com confined to a simple democracy authoritarianism bin binary, and we can no longer assess whether authoritarianism is getting more totalitarian or not. We are less cognizant than Lovenstein's generation had ever been about the fact that authoritarianism is a dictatorship. We constantly qualify authoritarianisms to make them sound liberal by adding qualifiers such as competitive. As we keep studying the state only to unmask an essentially evil nature, increasingly libertarian young generations that we raise never imagine that the constitutional democratic state is ultimately necessary to implement the rule of law, human rights, and at least a decent modicum of civil, political, and social equality. I believe we should reclaim the democratic state, and that it's precisely the time to assert the universality and indivisibility of civil, political, social, economic, and cultural human rights, and for solidarity on an eclectic, inclusivist, cross-class, cross-identity basis. And we should do so not only domestically everywhere, but also transnationally as you know, uh, populist leaders are in solidarity with one another, so must the democratic oppositions. I want to leave you with the thought that the political crisis is at the same time an opportunity, but only if we engage with the political task at hand and not just escape to historical determinism, parochialism, exceptionalism, and the defeatism of grand theory arguments. True, we'll have to tame the state's coercive capacities to make it uphold human rights and the rule of law, but we should remember that when they fulfill their function to serve the common interests, constitutional democratic states can indeed distribute equal rights, equal liberties, and goods and services to empower their otherwise unequal and essentially diverse populations and make them equal citizens. Only our ability to envision that kind of a new deal can help us surf through this politically regressive era. Thank you so much for listening.
Okay. Thank you everyone for, uh, for uh, coming and participating. Thank you, Eisen, for this incredibly uh, knowledgeable and provocative talk. Uh, <laughs> okay, so now uh, we will move directly to questions. Uh, we've been debating whether we should have you write them in the chat, but I think instead we will just ask you to use the raise hand function and we're intending to try to um, recognize people as they raise their hands. Now, the way where you can find that is apparently in the participants um, button towards the bottom. And um, if you click on participants, it should give you the option to raise your hand. Or you can just wave at me frantically, and my assistant can perhaps, uh, Jeremy Kane can perhaps look at the second uh, um, second uh, um, screen because we have quite a number of people. So questions to Eisen. Feel free, speak up. Claudia, is that a question? No. Uh, I see, okay, I see somebody here. Uh, Tron, last name. Okay, hi. I was um, wondering, you spoke a Can little you, bit could about- Could you turn your uh, video on? Uh, that would be helpful. Oh, I am in a, I'm in a public location. Okay, <laughs> okay. fine. Um, uh, I was wondering, so you spoke a little bit about the external shocks. I was wondering if that is um, a common factor that we've seen in um, previous historical cases um, where fascism has arisen. and. In particular, you spoke about COVID as a shock, but obviously right-wing populism has been on the rise far, um, you know, before COVID. Um, so what, so if an external shock is usually seen in these cases, what was that exter original external shock that, um, that maybe catalyzed or, or helped to bring about this new um, wave of right-leaning populism? Thank you, thank you so much for this question. Um, external shocks uh, are typically told, uh, talked about when people, historians, write about Nazi Germany and Italy and those cases, and it's typically the war, you know, something external, not due to the internal political and economic processes of the country at hand, but something that is outside of that country that happens and suddenly is, is an entirely new variable that ch makes everything even worse. It's typically used in that sense. So uh, war and uh, post-war settlement, the Versailles Treaty, these are the examples that people give to uh, your ex external shock when they explain what that means in those contexts. In the context with what that we're looking at, uh, one of the questions that was implicit in, in my talk, but I didn't address, I didn't say much about it, or, or I said a few sentences about it. Um, of course, there is no direct link between 1930s fascism and today. I mean, uh, right-leaning uh, populism could be could be, I mean, just theoretically, analytically uh, possible that it's something completely unrelated to uh, the right-leaning populisms of 1930s. I'm very much aware, perhaps this is not that crowd, I'm not sure, but in many crowds uh, right now in intellectual circles, some people are vehemently against the idea of uh, using the comparison with the 1930s in order to explain what's happening today. I'm not one of those people, obviously. So from, the, uh, from a more uh, cautious perspective, uh, I, I wanted to justify as to why I'm looking at 1930s, why I think it is really, it could be very helpful to us, despite the, even then it wasn't inevitable. So I'm not making an inevitability argument here. Uh, COVID being an external shock is important in this respect. Uh, if economic crisis, if the crisis of legitimacy, if the rise of monopoly, 
if the failure of the markets, if the dissolution of classes, if the job and income security loss, if uh, increasing anxieties, anxiety, uh, increasing insecurities, it, to the extent that these are relevant to the rise of right-leaning populism and leading to the crisis of the state, as it cannot cope with so many variables all at once, COVID was just an ex, you know, external uh, added uh, factor that probably intensified all of the above that I just uh, counted, you know, all of these economic and political crises and uh, unemployment and uh, whatnot. You know, everything is intensified as a result of it. I hope I responded. Did I respond to the question? Yeah, uh, I think so. Okay, she's yes, not. Thank you. Okay. Uh, do we have other questions? Uh, ben? Ben Allen? Mm -hmm. Yes, um, thank you very much for this talk. I really enjoyed it. Um, I have two questions, but I, I can just do one and then see if there are other people that have questions. I'm curious how essential um, real material economic conditions are for the rise of right-wing populism. I recall an interview that Newt Gingrich gave in 2016. It wasn't about economic conditions, but um, I feel like it could apply. He was talking about crime rates in America and who he was interviewing with said, well, he was saying, you know, people feel unsafe, crime is going up. And the person that he was talking to said, well, actually crime is going down. Here are the statistics for it. And he said, well, you know, sure you have, you have your facts, but you know, people feel like the crime is going up. And I, and I think that in a similar case, you could apply that to economics in 2016 you know the the economy is recovering but people might feel like you know actually it's, it's not from whatever sort of ideology they're consuming and so i wonder if uh you know actual material conditions are are so necessary for the rise of right-wing populism or if um you know we're just sort of entering into a into a part of history where you know there's just like a sort of divide. It does, my worldview doesn't actually need to cor correlate with the facts. And that makes us more susceptible for right-wing populism. No, thank you for this question. Definitely, the, it has a lot to do with the, that's what I try to uh, talk about uh, by using Levinstein's and Ely's uh, arguments. Uh, even then, it was an economic model, first and foremost, because there was a dissolution of the economic forces, economic compromises, um, some classes rising up, some classes completely disappearing and uh, becoming impoverished, uh, loss of status, for many of them, lots of insecurity and lots of uncertainty for a mass uh, amount of people. And uh, the inability of the existing institutions, political parties, trade unions, um, um, not only in the left, but also in the you know, center right, uh, their inability to voice the interests of, of these people, their inability, because it's due to the, not only the economic conditions per se, but the crisis uh, is at the same time uh, coupled and intensified with the rise of the digital economy. So the mode of production is changing. So on the one hand, you have a mode of production that's beginning to change and some sectors, some service sector people producing in an entirely new form of 
production. And then you have industrial classes and there is deindustrialization going on. Uh, due to globalization, there is flight of capital, this and that, they have happened, but there is still an industrial class, industrial classes. So there is that, that mode of capitalist mode of production. And you have feudal forms, of course. You have at the same time very feudal uh, forms of uh, more patronage based economic relationships. Um, perhaps in some sectors, in some regions, uh, in all these countries. This, this makes the uneven development situation, which eventually, you know, Ely argued, this is one of the most important factors that created this political uh, impact, that political opening for the right-leaning uh, populism. Uh, it, was the, it is that uneven development, and perhaps we are going through uh, at least as much, if not worse, kind of it. Because uh, then uh, it was nearly the, yes, in the, in, in the, during, in the, after the First World War, there were some technological developments. And Ely recounts this as one of the reasons as to why some of the occupations were, uh, you know, uh, dissolving, some new forms of uh, producing, some new occupations were rising. But uh, today, uh, it, it's something even more dramatic. I believe. And the COVID situation just may have quickened something that perhaps we were going to encounter more slowly in the course of the next decade or so. Now we suddenly look at us, I mean, having a Zoom meeting talking about such issues. So it's quickened in a way that digitalization of uh, what we're having. And this create, of course, extremely narrow interests. It's very difficult. I mean, the reason the po political parties, the reason the states cannot bring those interests together is because really people's interests are, um, when you look at them, they are very narrow and very divergent from one another. Someone has to point them out that, but that is common to your interest. That is common to your interest. And we can do that. <laughs> and to this group, we can do that. To this group, we can give that. But because that requires an intervention state, and it looks like there is an objective ground for the rise of an intervention state right now, only the fascist candidate for that role is now in the stage, <laughs> in a way. It's the yeah, yeah. first political response, and it sets the stage. Once it sets, sets the stage and creates a mass movement, then uh, you have a difficult situation because you have to take that into account. That's a new variable for you. You have another question from Sarah Arat. Unmute yourself, please. Yes, I'm looking for it. Uh, well, thank you, Aishan. This was a wonderful presentation, very rich, very thought-provoking, and I'm not sure even if I can put my questions together because they are going in various directions. And you provided partial reading list for my uh, seminar for next semester, regi regime types. <laughs> so thank you for that too. Uh, I have uh, two questions, and uh, that, that is actually, both of them are kind of related to right-wing and left-wing uh, uh, connection. Uh, one of the things, if I did understand right, the um, rise of fascism was at least partially a response to the success of the left and the, or the challenge posed by the left. And uh, I, uh, I am interested in, in that because uh, just a kind of, there are a lot of sim similarities, I agree, between what happened back then and today, but also there are differences kind of going, maybe we need to talk about those differences as well. And the, uh, now, it seems that populism is on the rise because the left is rather inadequate in responding to the problems faced by 
particularly lower classes, the consequences of the um, latest phase of neoliberal uh, economic globalization, uh, for example. So uh, I wonder what you think about that. And the second related, the left, left uh, not related, but the left-right uh, connection. Uh, I always have a problem in defining populism. That is like the in the generic terms. So kind of like I know it when I see it, <laughs> we have that. But the uh, conceptually, if we want to talk about left and right populism, first we need to have the populism definition and then the left and right. So you kind of gave us a left wing, uh, I'm sorry, right wing populism definition, which doesn't allow me to come up with the right, uh, left wing one. So what would be your left wing definition. I, I promised that I was going to come and be a hacker and I, here I am. <laughs> okay, thank you, Zera. The first question, the backlash against the rise of the left, uh, there, is, there is definitely uh, a backlash against, against the uh, left. Um, today too, I mean, then, you know, I shared some uh, pieces uh, from uh, some sentences from Ely where he underlines a few times actually in that essay uh, because there's a revolutionary left and because it's making some advances and because the trade unions are so strong because the SPD and the Communist Party are so organized under the Weimar and Weimar constitution I did not share it here but Franz Neumann in his behemoth, he really talks extensively about the labor rights and the constitutional law of the Weimar Republic. The first part of the constitution is a typical liberal democratic constitution, but the second part of the Weimar constitution, labor rights are extremely guaranteed and secured and very strong. So as a result of that, for that generation, his generation, at the very beginning of 1930s, Nobody really embraces the uh, Weimar Republic, uh, despite the fact that they find those progressive aspects of it uh, very nice. They see the second part of the constitution, the socialists and communists, I mean. They see the second part of the constitution, the real constitution, and they all thought in time it's going to revert itself into a socialist state. So as a result of that, because Weimar was such a, uh, it's, it was new, it was, it was uh, just, you know, it has just uh, appeared in the scene and uh, there weren't any groups that really embraced it, that really wanted to preserve it. Everyone had a first best option for the socialist and communist. It was obviously a socialist state or lack of state. Uh, for the you know, other groups, they wanted royalism back. They wanted the Prussian monarchy back. They wanted you know, some, some other thing that was left behind by 1918 back. So there was that. So as a result of this, uh, Weimar was a, a very, you know, difficult place that its constitution is not really embraced by anyone and supported by anyone, by any social force. Uh, backlash against the left uh, was uh, significant also from that reason, for that reason. Uh, the fact that it was a uh, revolutionary and uh, they knew that, uh, the, the, and there's, of course, there's the Soviet factor. You, you, you do have the Soviet Union there. So it's an entirely different kind of world, uh, the possibility of Germany turning uh, socialist. Uh, it seemed to the jurists, uh, ju judiciary, which judiciary was uh, typically coming from the old ruling classes uh, during the Weimar years, for them, uh, that was a genuine biggest threat. The biggest threat they wanted to avoid was that communist revolution, socialist revolution. So uh, they really, for example, they did let uh, Hitler get away with two coup attempts. He was arrested after two coup attempts and they let him get away with it because they really do not see that moment is the real problem they are going to have, is the real trouble they are going to have. 
Let me just jump in to say we have a long list of questioners, so it has to be a little right. bit from everyone. So, but could you answer her uh, on the left-wing populism? I was going to ask yeah, her. The second her. question, I thought you were asking a few questions, but there in the second question as well. You seem to be raising the question of what is populism so that I can understand what is right-leaning populism. Populism is, I'm using it in a very descriptive sense, it's a mass movement. So in that sense, despite the fact that I usually think right-leaning populism is a misnomer, we shouldn't call it really populism. For example, in the US context, we typically reserve that term populism normatively for the left. It's for the you know, working classes, mass movement. Uh, so it's left-leaning. Populism means to the benefit of the working classes, to the benefit of the masses. So there is even an ambivalence and perhaps it's a misnomer. Uh, if we use right-leaning populism to describe that. But I think it's useful to alarm us to the fact that it's not merely one guy and five of his monopoly capitalist friends. They managed to forge an eclectic mass movement. So in that regard, it is populist, either in its left or right varieties. I hope I responded to that question. Um, Shayla is next. Yes. Un unmute yourself, okay. Unmute. You have to yeah. unmute. You have to okay. Unmute. Yeah. Uh, hi, Aishan. This was such a wonderful lecture. So good to, to listen to you. Um, the Weimar syndrome has been talked about worldwide, you know, and um, there are many regime types that seem to fit into the uh, formula that you're studying, uh, Turkey, uh, Hungary, um, Poland, um, but I'm, I'm really wondering how much do you really think that this syndrome works for the United States um, in, the, in the following way, uh, because I think that you, you want to talk about the current situation as a global, as a global context, and I share that, and I really, um, I, I really like what you did in terms of the leadership model and the deep structural model. Um, it, it's very hard to apply some of the categories to the United States, isn't it? And um, in the sense that, what do you do when you have a duopoly? When you have a party system that seems to be incapable of coalition forming because there are no third and fourth mediators, right? I mean, this is, this is a kind of impossible uh, impossible situation and at the same time at the same time that you have some of these features very much the fixation on the leader uh, the weakening of constitutional protections uh, the weakening of civil society uh, you, you know you have uh, you have a country where the class structure doesn't quite doesn't quite map onto onto this model, which I think applies very much more to uh, Europe, Middle East to some extent, Latin America. So I'm 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 puzzling. Uh, this is genuinely a question for a project that we share in common, and I'm not asking you know a critical question. I'm asking. Let's think about this together. Can we really understand the U.S. and what's happening maybe at this moment also through these uh, categories, which if we can't, we can't. I mean, there is no, there is no harm in that. But, you know, in comparative politics, you always have to sort of, you know, define and limit and specify, you know, the categories. So I look forward to your answer. Good to see you. Sheilajim, it's wonderful to see you. Thank you for this question. Uh, we will disagree on this a little. 
uh, as you were uh, raising the question, I was thinking, uh, it seems to me, if I rephrase your question, you seem to be saying uh, the coalition building, eclectic coalition building, the, uh, you know, bringing parties together kind of coalition building, that you're talking about, Aishan, in the Weimar context, uh, apply to a multi-party system, whereas U.S. has only two political parties, which uh, inevitably creates a different kind of uh, interest uh, articulation and uh, coalition building, and it, these do not apply uh, to, to the case of the U.S. Would that be, an, I'm assuming, I'm hoping, stop me, uh, if it's I'm not a, you know, a, a, a accurate description of, of, of the position you're taking. Um, I, have, I have two words for you, Günther Roth. Günther Roth, um, he wrote about neo-patrimonialism. Uh, you know, last year I was working on that one, and it's very much related to the work I'm doing now uh, on these cases. Günther Roth, looking at the American political system and the party system and the interest articulation and coalition building system, says it's neo-patrimonial and patronage-based from the very beginning. So those two parties that we see are already coalitions in themselves. And uh, they have ruling coalitions, they have working coalitions, let's say, uh, for many decades, uh, and then they are no longer able to hold on even to, to the uh, regular people that they have uh, under their coalition because people's interests have uh, diverged uh, and they're, you know, these are no longer represented by the political party system. So in that sense, uh, if, if we think of American party system, two parties as already coalition parties, uh, mm -hmm. Then, in that sense, the arguments that I'm making about any kind of right-leaning populism and its success in coalition building, in its success in uh, making, in remaking and building uh, cross-class and cross-identity coalitions, that success definitely applies to what say Trump is doing today. Uh, he really me remade his party, <laughs> bringing uh, entirely uh, perhaps disparate populations together and um, perhaps even uh, getting the votes of some of the minorities. And we know for a fact uh, there is mass support there, both from the peasantry, ur uh, rural poor and the urban poor. So uh, with that perspective in mind, the neo-patrimonial aspects of uh, American, uh, you know, politics uh, and its patronage-based give and take <laughs> uh, coalition building uh, under the two parties, even under the Democratic Party, by the way. Günther Ross uh, typically uses the, as the patron model, he uses is Kennedy. Uh, <laughs> so uh, there is, there is, there are some uh, aspects uh, of that uh, clientelism, patronage, uh, give and take, promising something, building a coalition, uh, giving something in exchange for votes, that kind of clientelism. Uh, these are part and parcel of American politics, unfortunately. We have several others. <laughs> It, could, it would be interesting to hear both of you continue, but Aaron Bentley, no? Um, okay, uh, I wanna interject and then I'm gonna call on Syrah, who I know wants to ask a question. Um, I just, uh, two things. First of all, on the left-wing and right-wing populism, I think populism is, is very difficult to define, but it, I don't know that it, I'm happy with just calling it mass movement. I like John Judas's effort to distinguish left-wing populism from right-wing populism. Are you familiar with it? Uh, with the uh, tripartite aspect of left-wing populism as against right-wing populism. Uh, there's general agreement about the leader, um, I, uh, the criticism of elites and the division of society into the non-elites and the elites and uh, the uh, effort to, of a leader to embody um, uh, 
you know, well, just just the just the two just that division is important. But the 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 right wing populism adds the element of an excluded third class third group that is blamed for the problems. But I just wanted to mention that my question is actually a little different. Um, uh, what's missing, it seems to me, uh, well, one thing that seems to be missing uh, is something we discussed at the recent APSA meeting, uh, that old-fashioned idea of patriarchy um, that's evident in right-wing populism. In, uh, and it's, um, I just wonder what you think about it, the feminist uh, point, both to see at least the present situation in the United States as um, a reaction against feminism, but also the people who are affiliated with it, with these, with the right wing popular authoritarian populist movements. There are some women, you know, the whole QAnon thing are women, but mostly they are um, very much male dominant, uh, macho kind of um, men. Do you think this is a factor and, and generally features of authoritarian personality kind of issues that you, you haven't mentioned anything about that? Does that play a role at all? It does play a role. And um, I wish I have presented another, another paper of mine uh, I have presented three years ago at Yale at the uh, Christ of Democracy Conference. There I have talked about the fact that uh, their enemies unite uh, right-leaning populists, quote-unquote populists, and uh, enemies I have counted as, you know, all sorts of ethnic, religious, sexual minorities, women, of course. Uh, so I think it's, a, you know, their misogyny uh, is across the board uh, a factor that we see in all these cases and particularly in the same way. But um, I didn't talk about ideology at all uh, today during this talk. No, because it's in ideological, the, it's more characterological, personality. But, but it's, it's also um, ideological. I mean, also, because yeah. the, those right-leaning populisms as proto-fascisms are always anti-women, they are misogynist, they are patriarchal, and um, there's, there's no question uh, that in, in each of those movements, when we look at them, they have very similar, <clears throat> because the reason is, there's that Cesaro papist uh, missionary zeal there. They want to uh, revive something from the you know, past, but, uh, they would like to uh, give it a new uh, shape using the technology. Herf calls it reactionary modernism. So there's that paradoxical synthesis that goes on in their ideology. The reason I didn't talk about ideology is, is such a large topic uh, in the, in the, you know, because I'm teaching this course, it, it runs through all this. I would love to write a paper on, on, on their ideology because there is that debate among people, some claim fascism is merely a technique of power, it is a pattern of conquest, you know, they, it is just will to power type of thing. But uh, for some others, uh, there is definitely a religious nationalist aspect of it. Uh, whatever is the, you know, my take on it, whatever is the majority in a country in terms of ethnicity and religious sect, they mobilize, they, they define that as their base. So whichever sect and whichever uh, ethnicity is uh, the majority in a country, that they are going to uh, define as their identitarian majoritarian base. So that ideological, uh, these ideological traits are very much, I think, across the board true in all these uh, cases. Okay, they we have, women. we have, hate women. I'm sorry? They okay. hate women. Yeah, well, yeah. Syrah. Uh, thank you so much for uh, this great talk. Uh, I truly enjoyed it. Uh, my question again <laughs> goes back to this uh, notion of populism. And uh, I know many questions have already been asked, but um, I mean, um, I would hope that uh, you would also consider this. Um, like, I, I have always been um, 
Um, I, I, I generally have problem with this idea of populism because I think if a notion can be used to both describe Trump and Sanders, that notion is probably on a level of abstraction that is not like useful. So, um, and uh, with, in this regard, um, I think uh, for fascism, and this is like uh, kind of uh, close to what Carol was saying that, um, um, and this is the distinction that you can find in the works of Adorno and Lowenthal, that uh, what uh, distinguishes fascism from um, like leftist, mass movement uh, or re revolution or whatever, because the left also needs the people for, uh, if the idea of revolution, we take it seriously, we also need the people. So uh, what distinguishes uh, these two is the irrationality of um, fascism. And for that irrationality, like there, uh, it, it is kind of like very minimalistically defined, but it's, I think it's a good measure uh, that can be used. For example, like you don't have um, inference in fascist discourse. Uh, it's, it works um, basically through association. Uh, it doesn't uh, try to persuade the audience, but tries to manipulate the psyche um, and, uh, you know, some other issues. And uh, the other question that I have uh, goes back uh, again to the issue of the strength of the left, because I've seen that this argument has been used a lot to um, and were used a lot in 2016, especially and 2017, to kind of dismiss the claims that Trump cannot, like we, we are not facing fascism because for fascism, we know that historically you need a, um, like a strong leftist movement. So the anxiety, so the, like the fascist leader and fascist discourse can use the anxiety it would create for people uh, and all to um, um, like kind of uh, make them vote for uh, this fascist leader or uh, party. But uh, now what we are seeing is that you don't have a strong left and, and neither in this country nor in any other country that we have like strong fascist movements. But still like this is the crazy aspect of it. You don't have any like leftist movement, but, but uh, it's as if Trump uh, or that like Fox, Fox News, that type of discourse, fascistic discourse in this country, just creates uh, that idea of the left. So it's not objective. You don't have a strong left, but they can pretend that you have such a thing by uh, by uh, calling um, Biden a fascist, uh, uh, I'm sorry, a Bolshevik, a uh, communist, a socialist, which doesn't make sense. So I was wondering like if the idea of a very strong uh, leftist movement, not the idea, the objective reality of a strong leftist movement is really key for fascism to be able to like uh, to get to power. Oh, I'm going to start from the second question. These are wonderful questions. I have to think about it. It's an empirical question. I don't think we know the answer to your second question, whether um, the existence of a really uh, <laughs> left left movement and uh, organized left uh, is is really the cause uh, for these guys to 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 do uh, to become so radical um, in their leanings. Um, it seems to me, based on the observations I'm having in those, you know, movements, recent movements, I also think about the fact that um, they keep using this language, those socialists, those, those leftists, those communists, you know, they are going to do this, they are going to do that. And, you, you know, you, not only here, you see it in every country uh, where right, right, meaning populist leader uh, is present. You look at their speeches and they keep mentioning that as a, you know, factor, you know, look, if I'm, you know, if, if you topple me, here is what you're going to be dealing with. He's really threatening the forces that are supporting him. Um, so I guess at that level, it doesn't really uh, matter. There is a... Um, there is a, a real organized left or not. Perhaps even the fact that the objective circumstances 
for the existence of a revolutionary left when these are present in that context, that is sufficient uh, to give uh, whichever uh, portions of the bourgeoisie supporting uh, these uh, right-leaning populists, uh, it, 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 is, it is enough for them to cement their coalition just based on the potential <laughs> rise of a, a revolutionary or strong or organized left. The economic crisis, the unemployment levels, all of these uh, they must be looking at with worry from that perspective. Uh, I don't know whether I could respond to your question. Yeah. I, you know, that's the uh, and the first first one. I agree with you. I mean, uh, irrationalism uh, definitely could be one of the uh, ways in which we can uh, distinguish uh, left leaning and right leaning from one another. Um, there is a very interesting essay, the last essay uh, that. Uh, he has written by Franz Neumann before he was killed in a car accident. I think in 1951, he writes this article called Anxiety and Politics, where um, he really tries to understand what makes these people, masses, follow these madmen like this. How, how did it happen? He's still trying to understand in the post-war period. And uh, he's making some interesting uh, distinctions uh, there, uh, particularly about the irrational aspect of it. You might want to have a look at it. Thank you for the question. Okay. And we have time for just one more uh, quick question from Jeremy Kane. Hi, um, thanks so much for your talk. Um, it was brilliant. At the end, you said something about a problem with the dominance of um, relativism and maybe um, kind of a lack of a universalist politics. I'm just wondering if you could maybe speak more about that specifically in relation to um, the US context maybe, or um, globally. Um, just wanted to sort of maybe flesh out what you meant by that. Uh, what I meant by that is um, a rise of some cultural relativism is particularly felt uh, in certain countries, for example, in Turkey, uh, with a um, sting to the women's rights. You know, what I have in mind when we, when we uh, conduct some, some kind, of, kind of cultural relativist uh, understanding of human rights, um, then there's a question of if there are civil, political, social, economic, cultural rights, um, if you are cultural relativist, for the cultural relativist, the question is, are you then going to prioritize cultural rights of a group which is typically ruled by men <laughs> and uh, you know, represented by men and making decisions to, based on tradition and because God tells them to whatever, because it's, it's done that way. What is our responsibility uh, in, in, in that kind of a situation? Are we going to, because we respect cultural difference, are we going to not talk about minorities within those societies, culturally different societies. Aren't we going to talk about the fact that women's rights in those societies are human rights? And that happens, unfortunately. These points have been muted uh, for a very long time. And uh, it's a difficult subject to talk about. Of course, there is, uh, you know, when there is a backlash against immigrants, when there is uh, Islamophobia, this and that, it's very difficult for people to even begin to address those questions. It's impossible to talk about it. Yet at the same time, uh, there is what I'm talking about. There are minorities within minorities. The safest way to, to get out of it is, is to talk about uh, the um, indivisibility of these different sets of rights from one another and universality of human rights for uh, everyone regardless of culture and group rights cannot trump uh, individual rights. And we have to, I think, uh, keep that in mind. That's what I'm alluding to a little bit. Okay, I've unmuted every, I'm trying to unmute everyone anyway. <laughs>
Yes, please join me in thanking uh, Aishan. Thank you so much. Talk. And it was great. And we'd love to have you come back and give us another talk sometime soon. It was I really, so. really good. Thank you so much. You're here. Thank yeah. you so much. Thank, Thank you to the audience for coming by.